Lesson 9 for February 20-26, to To Serve and to Save. Read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 20. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we read this lesson today, as we absorb it into our minds, as we take it to our heart, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. May the words from your book, the Bible, teach us that it's our opportunity to serve and to help save others, because that's what Jesus did. Help us to be generous to those about us with our time, our empathy, and our physical and emotional help as well. We pray that you'll bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah 40 and verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Let's read that again. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 640, we read, Many feel that it would be a great privilege to visit the scenes of Christ's life on earth, to walk where he trod, to look upon the lake beside which he loved to teach, and the hills and valleys on which his eyes so often rested. But we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, or to Bethany, in order to walk in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his footprints beside the sickbed, in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys of the great city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. End of quote. Isaiah spoke of a servant of the Lord with a similar mission of mercy. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. Isaiah 42, verses 3 and 7. Let's take a look at this servant. Who is he? And what does he accomplish? Sunday, February 21. Servant Nation. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, God speaks of Israel, my servant. Who is this servant? It reads, But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. And in chapter 42, verse 1, he introduces my servant. Let's read that. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Is it Israel, Jacob, the ancestor of the Israelites? The nation of Israel? The Messiah Christ, identified in the New Testament as Jesus? There are two kinds of references to servants of God woven through Isaiah 41 to chapter 53. One servant is named Israel or Jacob, which we've just read, and Isaiah 44 verses 1 and 2, Yet hear now, O Jacob my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen, thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you? Fear not, O Jacob my servant, and verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you, you are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. Isaiah 45 and verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. And Isaiah 48 and verse 20, Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, utter it to the end of the earth, say, The Lord has redeemed his servant 
Jacob. Because God addresses Israel or Jacob in the present, it is clear he, Jacob, represents the nation descended from him. This is confirmed by the fact that redemption for the Lord's servant Jacob is accomplished at the time when he is to go out of Babylon, as we just read in Isaiah 48 and verse 20. Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans, he was told. In other instances such as Isaiah 42, verse 1, which we've just read. But let's have a look at that again. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And chapter 50 and verse 10. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. And Isaiah 52 and verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And Isaiah 53, verse 11, He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. God's servant is named. When he is first mentioned in Isaiah 42, 1, his identity is not immediately apparent. However, as Isaiah develops his profile in later passages, it becomes clear that he is an individual who restores the tribes of Jacob or Israel to God, as in chapter 49, verses 5 and 6. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the end of the earth. And die sacrificially on behalf of sinners, as we read in Isaiah 52, verse 13, Right through to 53.12, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider." Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied." 
By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And we've also all already looked at Isaiah 49 verses 5 and 6. Therefore, he cannot be the same as the nation. So it is clear that Isaiah speaks of two servants of God. One is corporate, the nation, and the other is individual. Question, what is the role of the servant nation? Isaiah 41 verses 8 to 20. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. You, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions, and said to you, You are my servant, I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who are incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing, and those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you, shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them small, and make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwinds shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree. The myrtle and the oil tree, I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, and the Holy One of Israel has created it. God assures Israel that the nation is still the servant of the Lord. I have chosen you and not cast you off, Isaiah 41 verse 9. Then God gives to Israel one of the most magnificent promises in the Bible. Isaiah 41 verse 10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Here and in the following verses, one of the basic roles of Israel is to trust the true God to save them, as King Ahaz did not rather than to trust in other gods and their images as other nations do. And we'll look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 7. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths with the hammer inspired him who strikes the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. Then he fastened it with pegs, that it might not totter. And verses 21 to 24, Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. Or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed you are nothing, and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. And verses 28 and 29, For I looked, and there was no man. I looked among them, but there was no counsellor. Who, when I asked of them, could answer a word? Indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their moulded images are wind and confusion.
Notice how in Isaiah 41.14 the Lord calls the nation a worm. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. What point was he making? Look at the whole text to get a better answer. What should this teach us as well about our need to depend totally upon the Lord? Monday, February 22. Unnamed Individual Servant Question. What is the role and character of God's unnamed servant, whom God chooses and on whom he puts his spirit, as we read in Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 7? Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Choose the best answer or combination of answers. 1. He provides justice for the nations. 2. He accomplishes his goals quietly and gently but successfully. 3. He is a teacher. 4. He serves as a covenant between God and the people. 5. He gives light or hope by healing blindness and liberating prisoners. 6. All of the above. I think it's all of the above. Question. How does the role and character of this servant compare with that of the shoot from the stump of Jesse, on whom the Spirit of the Lord also rests, in Isaiah 11? Let's read Isaiah 11 just to refresh ourselves on that. Beginning at verse 1, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hold, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who were left, from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shina, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations, and will assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth, 
Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind he will shake his fist over the river, and strike it in the seven streams, and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people, who will be left from Assyria, as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. As in Isaiah 42, the Davidic ruler of Isaiah 11 acts in harmony with God, providing justice and deliverance for the oppressed, as well as wisdom and knowledge of God. We found that this shoot and root of Jesse is the Messiah, the divine child of Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, who also brings, as it says in verse 7, peace for the throne of David and his kingdom with justice and with righteousness. The servant in Isaiah 42 is obviously the Messiah. Question. How does the New Testament identify the servant of Isaiah 42, 1-7, who provides justice? Let's refresh with Isaiah 42, beginning at verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he sh will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth, he will not fail nor be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. And we compare that with Matthew twelve fifteen to 21 But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Matthew 12 quotes from Isaiah 42 and applies it to the quiet healing ministry of Jesus, God's beloved Son, in whom he delights, as we read in Matthew 17 Verse 5. While he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And Isaiah 42, 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And Matthew three sixteen and 17, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It is he whose ministry re-establishes God's covenant connection with his people, as we read in Isaiah 42, 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. And Daniel 9, 27, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. 
and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Jesus and his disciples gained justice for people by delivering them from suffering, ignorance of God, and bondage of evil spirits caused by Satan's oppression. As you read in Luke 10.19, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Then God died to ratify the new covenant, as you read in Matthew twenty six twenty eight. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And to gain justice for the world by casting out Satan, the foreigner who had usurped the position of ruler of the world, as we read in John twelve thirty one to 33 Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. And so to finish the day, look at Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4, the depiction of Christ. Spend some time dwelling on the life of Christ. What specific characteristics of his ministry so aptly fulfilled this prophecy? What lessons can we learn about how we should be ministering to others as well? Isaiah 42, beginning at verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Tuesday, February 23, Persian Messiah Question. What stunning predictions appear in Isaiah 42, 26 to 45, verse 6? Who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers? Who says to Jerusalem, You shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah, You shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places? Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says to Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and loose the armour of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you, and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze, and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord." and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Isaiah's ministry lasted from 746 BC to about 685 BC. After mentioning a conqueror from the east and from the north, in Isaiah 41, verses 2, 3, and 25. Let's begin with verse 2 and 3. Who raised up one from the east? Who in righteousness called him to his feet? Who gave the nations before him and made him rule over kings? Who gave them as the dust of his sword, as driven stubble to his bow? 
who pursued them and passed safely by the way that he had not gone with his feet. And verse 25 or was it 27? Verse 25. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun he shall call on my name, and he shall come against princes as though mortar, as the potter treads clay. And implying that this was a good name for Jerusalem, as we read in Isaiah 41 and verse 27. The first time I said to Zion, look, there they are. And I will give to Jerusalem one who brings good tidings. Isaiah accurately predicted Cyrus by name and described his activities. He did come from the north and east of Babylon and conquer it in 539 BC. He did serve God by releasing the Jews from their Babylonian exile and he did authorize the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, as we will read later today in Ezra chapter 1. Put this prediction into perspective. Since there are about 146 years from the time of Isaiah's death to the fall of Babylon, his prophecy was a century and a half ahead of its time. It would be like George Washington predicting that a man named Dwight Eisenhower would help liberate Europe in 1945. Because the actions of Cyrus are well attested from the variety of ancient sources, including Babylonian chronicles, his own report in the Cyrus Cylinder and the Bible, as we read in several passages, the accuracy of Isaiah's prophecy is beyond dispute. Second Chronicles chapter 36 and verses 22 and 23. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all this people? May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And in the first chapter of Ezra, it's uh, mentioned as well. Let's see if we can find that in Ezra chapter 1. And there we read, beginning in verse 1, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, beside the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem, and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Midrithath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Shezbazar, the king, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them. Thirty golden platters, one thousand silver platters, twenty-nine knives, thirty gold basins, four hundred and ten silver basins of a similar kind, and one thousand other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were five thousand four hundred. All these Shezbazar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to 
Jerusalem. And Daniel 5 mentions that as well. And then in Daniel 6 verse 20, So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This confirms the faith of people who believe that true prophets receive accurate predictions from God, who knows the future far in advance. Question, why does God call Cyrus his anointed? Isaiah 45 and verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armour of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. The Hebrew word for anointed here is the word from which we get the word Messiah. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, this word could refer to an anointed high priest, as we read in Leviticus 4, verses 3 and 5. If the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed, a young bull without blemish, as a sin offering. In verse 5, then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of meeting. And verse 16, the anointed priest shall bring some of the bull's blood to the tabernacle of meeting. And Leviticus 6.22, the priest from among his sons who is anointed in his place shall offer it. It is a statute forever to the Lord. It shall be wholly burned. An anointed Israelite king is another use, 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. So it was, when they came, that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And 1 Samuel 24, 6. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. And verse 10. Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. But my eye spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. And Second Samuel 22 verse 51. He is the tower of salvation to his king, and shows mercy to his anointed to David and his descendants for evermore. Or the Messiah, a future ideal Davidic king and deliverer, as we see in Psalm 2 and verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. From Isaiah's perspective, Cyrus was a future king sent by God to deliver his people. But he was an unusual Messiah because he was non-Israelite. He would do some things the Messiah would do, such as defeat God's enemies and release his captive people, but he could not be the same as the Messiah because he was not descended from David. By predicting Cyrus, God proved his unique divinity by demonstrating that he alone knows the future. We've got a few texts here to look at. Isaiah 41 and verse 4, Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. And verses 21 to 23. 
Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, says the King of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. And verses 26 to 20. Who has declared from the beginning that we may know, and former times that we may say, He is righteous? Surely there is no one who shows. Surely there is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words. The first time I said to Zion, Look, there they are, and I will give to Jerusalem one who brings good tidings. For I looked, and there was no man. I looked among them, but there was no counsellor who, when I asked of them, could answer a word. And Isaiah 44, verse 26. Who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers? Who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. He also reached out to Cyrus. As we read in Isaiah 45, verse 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. Isaiah 45, verse 3. So to finish the day, think about some other Bible prophecies that have come to pass as predicted, such as the kingdoms of Daniel 2, except the last, Daniel 7, or regarding the time of Christ in Daniel 9, 24-27, which we read just earlier. What kind of hope do these prophecies offer us as individuals? Wednesday, February 24. Hope in advance. The fact that Isaiah accurately predicted Cyrus by name disturbs people who do not believe that prophets receive predictions from God. To cope, they accept the theory that a second Isaiah, another prophet living in the time of Cyrus, wrote Isaiah chapter 40 to chapter 66. Thus the book of Isaiah is sawn in two the same fate traditionally understood to have befallen the prophet himself. Let's check that out with Hebrews 11 and verse 37. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. There is, however, no historical witness to the existence of a second Isaiah. If he did exist, it would be strange for the Bible not to mention him, because his message is profoundly important, and his literary artistry is phenomenal. Not even the oldest Bible manuscript, the Isaiah scroll from Qumran, has any break between Isaiah 39 and 40 that would indicate a transition to the work of a new author. Isaiah's basic message is consistent throughout his book, Trust the true God, including his messianic deliverer, rather than other powers. Scholars rightly emphasize the shift in focus between the Assyrian period in Isaiah 1 through to 39 to the Babylonian periods in chapters 40 and following. But we have found that Isaiah 13, 14 and 39 already envisage a Babylonian captivity. It is true Isaiah's chapter 1 to 39 emphasizes judgment, and Isaiah 40 to 66 emphasizes consolation. But in the earlier chapters, divine comfort and assurance are abundant also, and later passages such as Isaiah 42, 18 to 25, Isaiah 43, 22 to 28, and 48 1 to 11, speak of God's judgments on Judah for forsaking him, 
In fact, Isaiah's predictions of future comfort imply suffering in the meantime. Let's read those passages. Firstly, Isaiah 42, beginning at verse 18. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as he who is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but you do not observe. Opening the ears, but he does not hear. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will exalt the law and make it honourable. But this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes, and they are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey, and no one delivers, for plunder, and no one says, Restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to the robbers? Was it not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, nor were they obedient to his law. Therefore he has poured on him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle. It has set him on fire all around. Yet he did not know, and it burned him. Yet he did not take it to heart. And chapter 43, beginning at verse 22. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me the sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honoured me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have bought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins, you have wearied me with your iniquities. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for your own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance, let me contend together, state your case that you may be acquitted. Your first father sinned, and your mediators have transgressed against me. Therefore I will profane the princes of the sanctuary, I will give Jacob to the curse, and Israel to the reproaches. And Isaiah 48 beginning at verse 1. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who were called by the name of Israel, and have come forth from the wellsprings of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. For they call themselves after the holy city, and lean on the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name." I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth, and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them, and they came to pass, because I knew that you were obstinate, and your neck was an iron sinew, and your brow bronze. Even from the beginning I have declared it to you. Before it came to pass I proclaimed, It is to you, lest you should say, My idol has done them and my carved image and my moulded image have commanded them. You have heard, see all this, and will you not declare it? I have made you hear new things from this time, even hidden things, and you did not know them. They are created now, and not from the beginning, and before this day you have not heard them, lest you should say, of course I knew them. Surely you did not hear, surely you did not know, Surely from long ago your ear was not opened, for I knew that you would deal very treacherously, and were called a transgressor from the womb. For my name's sake I will defer my anger, and for my praise I will restrain it from you, so that I do not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake for my own sake I will do it. For how should my name be profaned, and I will not give my glory to another? And that brings us to our question for today. Though the nation did face terrible calamities because of the people's sins, some among them did not give up hope. They clung to God's promises, such as those found in Leviticus 26, 40-45. Read the verses carefully. Put yourself in the place of those Hebrews who were alive after the nation's defeat by Babylon. What hope could you find in 
these words. So Leviticus 26, beginning at verse 40. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their faithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, and that they also have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary to them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham I will remember. I will remember the land. The land also shall be left empty by them, and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt, because they despised my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them, to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But for their sake I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. And so to finish the day, read once more through Leviticus 26, 40-45. What spiritual principle do you see at work in those verses? What is the Lord saying to Israel there? How does the same principle work in our own lives? Let's read that again, Leviticus 26, beginning at verse 40. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, and that they also have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham I will remember. I will remember the land. The land also shall be left empty by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord your God. But for their sake I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Thursday, February 25. A Feeling and Suffering Servant Question. Who is God's servant in Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 12? Let's begin chapter 49 at verse 1. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he has hidden me. And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have laboured in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord, and my work with my God." And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to who, him who man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, 
and he has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, Go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west and those from the land of Sinem. God calls and names him before he is born, makes his mouth like a sword, and will be glorified in him. God uses the servant to bring the nation of Israel back to himself, to be a light of salvation to all the world, to be a covenant, and to release prisoners. There is plenty of overlap between this description and that of Isaiah 42, where we identified the servant as the Messiah. The New Testament finds the servant's attributes in Jesus Christ in both comings, as you read in Matthew 1 and verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And John 9 verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And John 17 verses 1 to 5, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he shall give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And Revelation 1, verse 16, He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And Revelation 2, verse 16, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And Revelation 19, verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Question. If this servant is the Messiah, why does God call him Israel here? As we read in Isaiah 49, verse 3. And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, of whom I will be glorified. Earlier we found that in this section of Isaiah, God's servant Israel, or Jacob, refers to the nation. But here the same Israel, without a parallel reference to Jacob, clearly applies to the individual servant who restores the nation to God. We read that in verse 5 as well. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him, for I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. The individual servant has become the ideal embodiment or representative of the nation whose failure has compromised its use of the name Israel. As we read in Isaiah 48 and verse 1, Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and have come forth from the wellsprings of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. Question. What new element appears here? 
in Isaiah 49, verse 4 and verse 7. Verse 4, Then I said, I have laboured in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord, and my work with my God. And verse 7, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Here is the first intimation of the difficulty involved in this servant's task. He laments, I have laboured in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing, and vanity, verse 4. An idea echoed in Daniel 9.26, An anointed one shall be cut off, and shall have nothing. But he clings to faith, in verse 4, Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. Alec Motyer observes, in the Prophecy of Isaiah, an introduction and commentary, page 387. Thus, Isaiah foresaw a servant with a real human nature, tested like we are, and proving himself to be the author and perfecter of the way of faith, a real personal faith that can still say, My God, when nothing any longer seems worth while. End of quote. Isaiah 49 verse 7 is startling. The servant is deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. But the Lord says to him, Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. So to finish the day, look back at Christ's ministry. Right up until the end, didn't he have reasons for discouragement? Yet he stayed faithful, despite outward appearances. How are we to do the same despite outward appearances? Friday, February 26. From the book Gospel Workers, page 117, Ellen White writes, In the work of soul winning, great tact and wisdom are needed. The Saviour never suppressed the truth, but he uttered it always in love. In his dealings with others, he exercised the greatest tact, and he was always kind and thoughtful. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave unnecessary pain to a sensitive soul. He did not sense a human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He never made truth cruel, but ever manifested a deep tenderness for humanity. Every soul was precious in his sight. He bore himself with divine dignity, yet he bowed with the tenderest compassion and regard to every member of the family of God. He saw it all, souls whom it was his mission to save. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. As a class, read over what Ellen White wrote above about how Christ ministered to others. Discuss the principles there, and then, as a class, discuss how well your own church reflects those principles corporately. 2. Do you know a bruised reed or dimly burning wick, as we read in Isaiah 42.3? How can you help this person without breaking or quenching him or her? In what ways can you point such people to the Lord? In a practical sense, what would you tell them to do in order to get healing and help. And three, the argument for different authors of Isaiah originated from the premise that people cannot tell the future the way Isaiah did. What is the fundamental problem with this argument, and why must we, as Christians, reject that premise outright? So to summarise this week's lesson, 
Deliverance requires a deliverer. God's servant nation would be delivered by two deliverers, Cyrus, who would set the captives free from Babylonian exile, and an unnamed servant, whose identity as the Messiah is progressively revealed. The servant would restore justice and bring the community of survivors back to God. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Garage Church and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Ten-year-old Lewis moved with his parents to La Apatada, a town without a Seventh-day Adventist church in northern Colombia. Father and mother wanted Lewis to go to church on Sabbath. Lewis wanted to go to church, but the nearest Adventist church was located far away in another town. The district pastor had an idea. You should open a church, he said. Father liked the idea. Mother liked the idea. Lewis liked the idea. But where could people meet to worship? Their house was too small for many visitors. Why don't we use our garage, father said. It was a good idea. The garage was bigger than the house. Besides, it was empty because the family didn't own a car. Father told Lewis to invite his new friends from school to come to the garage on Tuesday for a one-hour meeting. Come to my garage to hear something interesting and get some good food, Lewis told his friends. Surely we'll come, they replied. Thirty-seven children between the ages of five and fourteen showed up the next Tuesday. Lewis spoke to the children about the importance of keeping promises. He read from a church-created program about good values. Afterward, Mother gave the children arroz con leche, a dessert made with rice and milk. Lewis invited the children to return the next week. Sixty-five children came. The garage was not big enough. So after three months, Father asked town authorities for a new place to meet. The mayor liked that Lewis was teaching good values to the many children. You can meet in the old town hall, he said. With so many children, Father decided to create Pathfinder and Adventurer Clubs. The two clubs met in addition to Lewis's weekly meetings on good values. Father saw an abandoned building that looked like an even better place to meet and received permission from the mayor to move. The mayor also gave one million pesos to renovate the place. On a July morning, just four months after the group first met in the garage, 70 children and adults gathered in the renovated centre for the first Sabbath worship service. Lewis was happy. Most attendees were children he had invited. Today, nine months after the garage first opened, 80 children and 20 adults worship in the centre every Sabbath. 38 people have been baptised. Lewis's town now has an Adventist church. I'm very happy because I've learned many new things, Lewis said. Most of all, I have learned that I can invite children to Jesus' feet. And there's a lovely photograph here on the left of the young Lewis. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.